Welcome to Wharton. Uh, I'm David Thornburg. I'm the Executive Director of the Fells Institute of Government here uh, at Penn, which is uh, Penn's graduate program in public policy and public management. And I'm delighted to see an almost full house. We, if there's anybody standing, guess not, but we have four or five seats here in the, uh, uh, in the front of the room. Uh, and let's get underway. This, I think, will be a, a timely, a terrific, a lively, and energetic uh, conversation about some of the most critical issues of the day. Um, I'm going to introduce our panelists uh, in a minute and also say a few more words about the program, but just one quick logistical note. Uh, Mayor Michael Nutter is on his way here. Uh, he asked us for about uh, 10 more minutes, uh, but uh, I think we can certainly excuse that given the demands of uh, managing the affairs of the sixth largest city in the country. So when he comes in, uh, I'll introduce him beforehand, but when he comes in, he'll be uh, primed and ready for action. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure uh, to welcome you here today. Um, the uh, topic at hand, uh, as I said, is about as fundamental as you can get. Uh, pol politics and the economy and the relationship between the two and really, uh, I think this particularly is relevant for Mayor Nutter, uh, the challenge of our elected officials and governmental leaders in working us through uh, uh, both psychologically and substantively one of the most challenging economies as we've come to hear since the Great Depression. Uh, although I would say for bits and pieces of the country, uh, the early 1980s were no uh, cakewalk as well, and we might sort of reflect uh, back on that. But this is a time um, when the, the, these two strands of political leadership uh, and economic policy and economic realities are probably more intertwined than in probably most of our lifetimes. Um, and uh, uh, we have in play in Washington right now, but also now percolating down at state and local levels. Uh, probably the most ambitious response to try to pick your metaphor, pump prime the economy, stabilize the economy, uh, affect an economic recovery, uh, put people back to work uh, than, than we've seen in, in many, many years. So the, uh, the challenges of political leadership in this context are really extraordinary. And I think that's going to be a, a theme that we keep coming back to uh, again and again in this panel. We're really uh, thrilled and honored and privileged to have uh, a, a top-notch uh, panel uh, here today to talk through some of these issues. And let me give a, a, a brief introduction to uh, the two who are here and, uh, and Mayor Nutter, who's on his way. Uh, Frank Luntz is Chairman Emeritus of Luntz and Maslan Maslansky Strategic Research. Uh, you probably have seen him. Uh, just about everywhere uh, you turn as a commentator, uh, a so-called pundit, uh, and as someone who is uh, one of the most knowledgeable people in this country about how language and the use of language influences uh, the political debates. Uh, uh, Bill Moyers, who's no slouch in that department himself, had this to say about Frank, that he's a magician with a gift for the politics of words and what words best connect with the hearts and minds of the public. Uh, he's a master of the form of the focus group uh, and public opinion surveys, having conducted over 1,500 uh, over the years. Uh, he works both for political clients and, and political campaigns uh, and for uh, corporate clients as well. Uh, and uh, you've, you found out, those of you who came here a little earlier, that he also uh, is a wonderful host, and he served. <laughs> two-thirds of you cookies before you uh, walked in. Two other little tidbits about Frank. One other uh, uh, description of him I particularly enjoyed that someone described him as the Johnny Appleseed of language. So not only does he do cookies uh, well, but he uh, certainly sprinkles the, uh, the world with words that work, the title of uh, his much acclaimed book, Words That Work. It's not what you say, it's what people hear. Then the other note uh, about Frank is that uh, early in his career, he spoke for 24 straight hours as part of the Oxford Union Society Guinness Book of World Records debate. So A, you don't want to get caught in a filibuster with Frank. <laughs> and B, I suspect if we wanted to, we could just wind up and let him go, and uh, that would be the program for the day. But uh, we're delighted to have uh, Frank here with us. Uh, 
Bob Gardner is founder and president of the Advocacy Group, a San Francisco-based firm specializing in corporate crisis and political communications. Uh, as Frank does, Bob has a, a long and very powerful uh, legacy and impact in the world of communications, both on the political side uh, and in the uh, uh, corporate side. Uh, uh, early on, he was a chief speechwriter for Donald Rumsfeld at the Cost of Living Council. He was one of four ad executives involved in Jerry Ford's razor tight presidential race in 1976. Uh, he helped run Dick Cheney's campaigns for uh, Congress. And uh, since then, uh, we were talking earlier, he's been in both, both involved in national level politics, California politics, which is a rare breed unto itself for those of you uh, who are, live and work out there, and has also been an enormously uh, influential, as someone said, ad guru uh, for corporate clients around the country uh, and around the world. And finally, in absentia, Michael Nutter is the, mayor, is the city of Philadelphia's 98th mayor. Uh, and. Uh, was elected with uh, an enviable margin of 83% uh, last November. Um, and uh, when, when the mayor gets here, I think we'll reflect a little bit about the change in circumstances even between his primary election and his uh, general election, and certainly since then, uh, and, and how the changing political tides have affected uh, his uh, uh, ability to lead and communicate with uh, people. Um, he has been a, uh, uh, a whirlwind uh, as a, a mayor, uh, rivals, for those of you who know him, uh, also Penn graduate Ed Randell in terms of his ability to be a thousand and one places at once, which probably accounts for why he's a little bit late, uh, and has really just thrown himself into the job, uh, brought fresh new talent, an enormous number of, of Penn graduates and Fells graduates uh, into government. and. Uh, uh, we have uh, enormous uh, high hopes for him. So there's the preliminaries. Uh, let me begin the discussion. And I'm largely going to play traffic cop here because you're really here to hear, hear these folks uh, as, as, much as, uh, uh, as much as anything. But let me just throw out a proposition, gentlemen. And if we agree on that one, then we'll go on. The proposition is that the last presidential election turned out to be largely a reflection on the economy, the change in economic fortunes, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and an enormous upwelling of, of desire for a uh, need for change. I think I reflect back to maybe uh, early September after the, um, uh, after the uh, Republican convention, uh, po post Palin, pre-meltdown, when I believe uh, Senator McCain was actually head in the polls for a brief moment. Uh, and then, as we know, things got really interesting. Uh, we agree on that point, or any finer point you want to put on that? 2-0 vote. Uh, well, first off, who's here for the 25th? I have to be the only person in this room that actually has more hair now than back then. <laughs> <laughs> and unlike the rest of you, I actually have a receipt for it. <laughs> Uh, 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 Mr. Smith, up there, you look like you've lost weight. I found it. <laughs> uh, if you go back to 2008, I don't believe it was about the economy. I believe it was about the past versus the future. And I believe you saw that in the primaries. You saw Barack Obama compare. Hillary Clinton was supposed to be the president. She was supposed to have won. She made a couple mistakes. She chose to live in Chappaqua, New York, which you all know is Indian for separate bedrooms. <laughs> Her husband turned out to have been a nightmare for that campaign. She was so negative, whereas Barack Obama was positive, and he outworked her. He knocked on 300 doors the last day of the primary trying to find the final undecided voters. She knocked on the same 300 doors. She was just trying to find Bill. <laughs> and, and on the Republican side, you got to admit, John McCain didn't need a vice president. He needed someone who knew CPR. The difference, the difference between Obama and McCain was that Obama, this is the biggest spread, by the way, statistically, so I can give you one piece of factual information. By the way, I came here from Nashville this morning. The mayor's coming from City Hall. He ought to fly USA in the future. Maybe we'll get here faster. 
and by the way, this, but this did make me feel at home because the mayor is more than 30 minutes late, so I remember my years at Penn when the professors would show up this late. But at least hopefully the mayor won't show up having been to one of the bars nearby. <laughs> We had the biggest, I told you guys not to invite me. <laughs> we had the biggest spread, last point is that we had the biggest age spread that we've ever had. And John McCain, if I can grab it here, John McCain could not even operate one of these. John McCain did not know how to use a Blackberry. You cannot be about the future, you cannot be about tomorrow when the American people were fed up with what had happened. And I know, I'm sure there are a few Republicans here and George Bush did well, considering English was his second language. <laughs> you, can't, you cannot get elected if you aren't representative of tomorrow. And Barack Obama was tomorrow. He was changed, and John McCain, an American hero, was still yesterday, and to me, that's what the campaign was about. So more uh, yeah, today to versus tomorrow rather than a reflection on... Uh the economy. Bob, yeah, all, all elections are change elections. Uh, nobody wants to do, even, even if you're running for your second term as an incumbent for president or anything else, it's still, what, I, what am I going to do in the next four years? It's not, gee, I was, had a great, four years can be a good base, but it's always about the future. It's always about change. And that was epitomized by the candidates. By the way, I, unlike Frank, uh, I'm, I am a pr practitioner of the black arts, but I don't do stand-up. <laughs> so, um, and I'm about as prepared for this as I was for my pen finals. <laughs> <laughs> Who says you don't do stand up? <laughs> but it, it was about change and, and um, but, but to your point, um, McCain was ahead or tied until the meltdown and um, uh, had that not happened and had he not performed so incredibly badly during that period and I have a lot of Republican insider friends who said how, how well Obama did. They, they remember they had a, a meeting at the White House. Both of them were there, both McCain and Obama. And apparently uh, McCain, and that was a, a closed door meeting, but apparently McCain was just terrible in that meeting and Obama really shined. And the partisans that are my friends that were in that meeting say that they were really impressed with him and they knew right away that he was going to do it. Yeah. So let's uh, roll forward to, to today and, uh, you know, the Obama administration. Um, both of you are practitioners of the art of communication back and forth, and I think principle one of communication is you listen before you talk. So i uh, start with you, Bob. What, what's your sense if you were kind of trying to capsulize the mood of the American people around the economy in particular uh, and how the president and his administration and other folks like Mayor Nutter ought to be responding to that move. Well, in an ideal world, you're supposed to listen before you talk. Uh, it doesn't always happen. But in this case, you had, uh, in, you, had you know, this thing that hit that, that uh, I don't know if very few people saw coming. And if they did see it, they didn't see it in the severity that it, that it happened. And George Bush said, I don't want to go down as Herbert Hoover. And he uh, and, and matter of fact, the subtext of that is I don't want to go down like my dad who lost primarily against Clinton because he didn't recognize that the economy was bad or he didn't recognize how the perception of it being bad. And so he took, uh, you know, lots of government action. He turned a lot, delegated a lot to Paulson for better or worse. And uh, it's been a long time since we've had a really good Secretary of the Treasury and I would say that included now. But uh, Paulson was the guy, and he was, you know, everybody loved Goldman Sachs at the time. Goldman Sachs was the gold standard, and uh, he, he turned it over to him, and, and it became, you know, very unrepublican, unconservative in the interference with markets, but that's what happened, and that's where the ball started. Frank? The public, the public is mad as hell. They're mad because they feel like they played by the rules, they had their jobs, they raise their kids the right way. They sent their kids to college. They assume that they could invest, they could put money in the market, and that they would be able to retire with a decent amount saved up. And then they start looking at it. And you all, because you guys are pen people, how many of you, how many of you have lost at least 20% of your savings in the last year? Raise your hands. Oh yeah. Oh how yeah. How many of you have lost? <laughs> <laughs> how many of you? How many of you? How many of you? Mayor, how 
Victoria. How many Mayor Nutter has. Oh. Mayor Nutter has the good sense to walk in on an applause line. I'll just tell you. <laughs> How many of you have lost thirty percent or more? Who's lost forty percent or more? It's like the forty percent. It's like the Price is Right. Has anyone lost? <laughs> anyone lost forty-five percent? Did you go to Wharton? <laughs> 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 what the hell? <laughs> So when a Wharton grad can lose that much money, you know that you're in trouble. And so the public looks at that and says that I got a raw deal. That's why they hate politicians. That's why they hate CEOs. And they see people in Wall Street, including a few in this room, still collecting your bonuses while they themselves are trying to pick up the financial pieces. And the reason why Obama's done so well is because he empathizes. He is an amazing communicator. You have to give him credit for this. When you look at the two people who went before him, Gore, and, uh, and Kerry. John Kerry looked like the tree that threw apples at Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> <laughs> I saved these for you. <laughs> is anyone here from New Mexico? Is anyone here from New Mexico? Tomorrow is the 64th anniversary of Area 51, where the aliens supposedly <laughs> landed Roswell, New Mexico. Did you know that exactly nine months to the day that the aliens landed, Al Gore was born? <laughs> <laughs> and so you've got Obama different from that, and so people feel like he's giving them hope, he's giving them opportunity, he's giving them a reason to believe in the future. Mary Nutter, you must wonder exactly what you walked into. <laughs> I, I signed up for this? Yeah, right. <laughs> This is just uh, fr Thursday, Friday afternoon of the improv. Right. <laughs> no, uh, quite I seriously. Thought it just, was Friday afternoon at Steinberg, Steinberg <laughs> Just, just to, to fill you in, on, to give you the Cliff Notes version of yeah. where we, what we've talked about tomorrow. The question was first, what was the election of uh, 2008 ultimately about? Economy, past, present, or you know, past or, or future? And then my question that you just walked in on that Frank was entertaining us with was the, the, the mood out there. What, what you hear, what you see, and, and how you respond to that. And you're the one on the hot seat here. You're the, with all due respect to our friends here, the uh, advisors can advise, but somebody's got to decide, uh, and, and that's you. So yeah. in Philadelphia and beyond, what, what, do, you, what do you hear, what do you see and, uh, among your constituents, and how do you respond? Uh, David, uh, thank you. Uh, Brian, thank you. And Frank, uh, I'm not sure. but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's uh, no, Frank. Thank you. Uh, uh, I know them both by reputation. I've never uh, met them uh, before, but uh, it's an honor uh, to uh, to be on the panel uh, with uh, with both of you. I just wish I'd been here from the start. Um, pleased to be with you this afternoon. Sorry, I was uh, running a little late. Uh, just uh, coming from an event. Um, Twenty-one people just graduated from a uh, weatherization uh, training program. Uh, courtesy of uh, economic recovery uh, opportunities, and um, it's uh, uh, 21 folks are going to be on their path to uh, to recovering uh, themselves uh, in this uh, crazy environment. It's uh, it's pretty ugly out there. Um, you know, Philadelphia's unemployment rate is now up over uh, nine percent. Uh, we have uh, law firms uh, laying off uh, lawyers, telling associates, uh, I mean, um, folks who just uh, signed on not to come. Uh, to uh, work, uh, give them a stipend, and uh, they've told them to go and do uh, do good uh, somewhere, and uh, we'll catch up with you next year. Um, folks were pretty upset about uh, some of the things we did last year. Uh, weren't uh, actually all that excited about the, some of the things we were trying to do uh, this year uh, because it's a pretty short conversation. Uh, we have no money, uh, and uh, there's not a whole lot you can do uh, if you don't have any money. So there's a lot of Nervousness uh, out there. Folks are worried about their jobs. I heard the question as I came in about uh, folks with their losing their savings. Uh, I think it's probably still true that the savings rate uh, in the country, of course, has gone up. Uh, not so much because Americans suddenly decided uh, that they wanted to be savers, uh, but that they're worried that they may lose their job, uh, and so they've, uh, to some extent, stopped spending. Uh, and they are worried about losing their job, and so they want to hold on to their savings as much as possible. This reminds me, of course, of uh, listening to uh, Colbert one night 
uh, when, who posed the question to someone and said, is your money safe or is it in a bank? Um, <laughs> uh, I, I think there's a whole lot of money under mattresses uh, right about now. Um, so it's, uh, it's a tough environment uh, out there. Every uh, uh, mayor across the country is experiencing the same thing. Uh, it's a little, it's tougher to be popular when you're uh, cutting services, closing down programs and raising people's taxes. Uh, it's a lot easier uh, to, be, uh, to be popular uh, when uh, you're kind of spending money, making people happy and uh, life is going along uh, in a happy-go-lucky fashion. So um, we're, um, we're experiencing that uh, certainly here uh, in Philadelphia, and, um, but uh, we're going to get through it. Uh, the Recovery uh, Act uh, and uh, its provisions are going to help us a great deal. Uh, but it won't stop us, uh, us when I say as mayors, uh, from making tough decisions. Uh, President Obama is not sending a check uh, for us to deposit in our treasuries. He's sending money to help put people to work. We'll eventually get uh, their uh, taxes uh, when they go back to work. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, we're going to have to make some tough uh, decisions, make some cuts, <laughs> and uh, tighten our belts. So, Let me uh, take up the, the, the question that you alluded to, Mayor Nutter, which is that it's always struck me that a lot of the challenge and opportunity of leadership is, is creating a sense of confidence in people about the, their future. Yeah. Uh, and uh, their confidence in the economy, uh, maybe in political leadership, has certainly been tested this last uh, year or so. So let me turn to our advisors uh, here, and then I'll get your thoughts. How do, does what you say, and, and what, what do you say to people that, uh, that can inspire a sense of, of confidence? Uh, and, and what do you do? I mean, you know, the, 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 the job of a mayor and certainly of a president is uh, a, a good part reliant on your symbolic acts and your presence and your visibility and so forth. So advisors, what, what would you advise uh, uh, this mayor or this president or governors uh, to do and say that creates a sense of confidence? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> we owe me some money. We just said <laughs> If you go back to the Great Depression and you look at the difference between Hoover and FDR, uh, a lot of there's a lot of revisionism now, now about whether FDR's policies really, how much they helped the, in the Depression versus whether he did enough or whatever. But there's no d question that he got the American people through it. He did it by radio. All of you remember radio? That used to be. Uh, and, and his fireside chats. And he inspired confidence. And he inspired the fact that, that we could look to the future and the future would be better than, than it is now. And that, I think, is, is largely responsible for, for his legacy and for getting, us, uh, for getting us out of the Great Depression as opposed to some of the policies. Now, Hoover was a, you know, a, a downer, a dour guy. He may have, he, he may have no, uh, he could make the trains run on time. He was a very, very good Secretary of Commerce before he became president. And, uh, but he had no ability to inspire confidence with the American people. And, and Roosevelt was just the opposite. At the present time, uh, Barack Obama is absolutely terrific at that, I think. And, uh, you know, he's, uh, you know, no question in my mind that he's the right person for the, for the job at the moment. And whether the policies will work is something else. And, and I think Frank would confirm this. And in, in most pollsters now, there's a, there's a, Barack Obama has huge approval numbers. I, d I don't know what, 60, 70, something like that. Uh, very high for this, this period in post-100 days. But the policies aren't doing so well. And there's a big gap between I agree with his policies and I agree with Barack Obama as an inspirational leader. So it's, it's very important. Obviously, can't get, the gap can't get too big uh, or you know, it catches up with you eventually. But right now, he's, he's doing great. Fr Frank, let me just push you a little bit because you're, you're a word guy. You're the word guy. Uh, and I want you to get a little more granular to sort of dip into your bag of words as you would advise a mayor, a governor, a president. What, what are the words that you use? I, I look at the difference between Obama and Joe Biden, the senator from nearby Delaware, vice president. Obama is always talking about what's going to happen, what good things will happen. It'll take time over the months and years to follow. Biden tells everyone, don't go out, 
Don't be in an enclosed place. <laughs> <laughs> Biden is the reason why Amtrak created the quiet car. <laughs> <laughs> So now the problem is we're only halfway done and I'm totally out of jokes right now. Uh, I'll give you a word. And the word is imagine. It is the most powerful word in the English language. Because imagine puts the communication in your perspective rather than ours. If I asked you to imagine the American dream, a friend of mine over there, uh, Brian Becker, who was the uh, Quaker when I was here, his son will be going to this school uh, starting in the, in the fall. For him, the American dream is that his son gets the chance to attend this p incredible institution, which is, by the way, so much better than we were here. <laughs> so <laughs> you, have, you, you have no idea. And one other point, this institution is bankrupting your parents, so you better be <laughs> So that imagine is all in your perspective. Imagine the American dream. Imagine life at perfection. Imagine how much your children can accomplish if they learn, if they are excited, if, if they are taught with people with passion and with inspiration. When you focus on that word, imagine, with passion and inspiration, you can take the most negative fear and turn it into a positive and get people, and this is where, frankly, Barack Obama is so good. His speech at the convention was remarkable, and I'm supposed to be on the other side, and I'm tearing up during it because of the symbolism and because of the power, and he also used a word, the negative word. He described all the things that George Bush had done, and then he said one word to end the conversation, move towards the future. Enough. He said enough. And everyone, you could, 95,000 people all looked at each other and nodded. That's the power of language. A single word communicates so much more than tens of thousands of words. Mayor Nutter, you, I would guess, have this challenge day in, day out, eight, ten times a day. Easy communicating to constituents, mm -hmm. your former colleagues on council, state legislators, communication one-on-one. -on -one. So how do you think through that, that challenge these days? Um, it was interesting listening uh, to, our, uh, to our two advisors about the gap between how people feel about you uh, personally and you know, what's going on in the current situation. I've uh, experienced uh, some of that uh, myself. And uh, you're, Juan, you're absolutely right. You don't want the, uh, you don't want the gap to grow. Uh, too, uh, too wide. Um, but uh, what I've apparently gotten good marks for uh, from the public is that uh, not only do they believe that I'm honest, uh, but also that uh, I'm uh, tackling uh, the tough issues uh, that uh, have needed to be tackled for some time, uh, but have been pushed off uh, by others. And so um, someone, there was some hold on by someone uh, the public has figured out that, uh, at least here in Philadelphia, that I did not create uh, the international economic crisis uh, by myself. <laughs> um, and, and so, you know, I get, uh, you know, uh, uh, in this particular case, you want very low marks uh, for, you know, is the mayor responsible for what, for, you know, the economic situation in Philadelphia? I mean, it's like, you know. Two uh, percent. I'd love to meet them, uh, just, <laughs> just so I could query them as to what do you think I did, um, and then uh, higher marks uh, for either you know personality or uh, just uh, taking on the tough uh, issues. Uh, no one's going to like uh, many of the things that we have to do, and so uh, a lot of our communication has been around. Um, this is where we're trying to get to. Um, we believe that uh, the next year or two, year, year and a half or two, are going to be very, very tough. This is our plan to get uh, to the other side of this. And these are the steps we're taking right now uh, to deal with it. We're not asking anybody for any more money. Uh, we're going to handle our uh, business here at home uh, on our own and that we're all in this together. So I talk about vulnerable populations. I talk about uh, why we need to do the things that we need to do and that, th that this will come to an end. Uh, in a very short time. Now, I don't know when it's going to come to an end, and the President uh, doesn't seem to know exactly when it's going to come to an end. And I tell folks, if anyone tells you they know when it's going to come to an end, uh, the best thing for you to do is get away from them uh, as quickly as possible. They're probably about to burst into flames. So, um, <laughs> but, but, but I, you have to give, I, I think you have to give folks not only a sense of the vision, but some definition. Uh, to where we are. How long do you think it's going to last? And your actions are built around 
uh, a certain amount of time frame, and ultimately it is, again, about the confidence uh, that you have to exhibit uh, that you know what's going on, you have a plan to attack it, and the future is going to be better, uh, but we have to stick together to make it happen. I mean, that's a lot of the Great. conversation I have. We have to, as we're talking about language and mood and tone, we have to talk about what seems like a more and more endangered species, and that's the Republican Party. So my question <coughs> particularly to Frank uh, and to Bob, because uh, Mayor Nutter, there are probably two more Republicans on this panel than maybe you've seen in the last six weeks or so here in Philadelphia. Yeah, so I, I you can take a bye I, 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 on this. I, I, I noticed you, you like. had to import some. <laughs> But, but uh, Bob and Frank, what do you say to the Republican Party, the National Party? And, you know, there wasn't a time, it wasn't too long ago, you go back to the mid-90s, uh, when you had some really good Republican mayors, uh, Giuliani or Reardon uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, looks to me like the Republican Party is, uh, uh, is kind of like the Wiley Coyote coming off the cliff and spinning the wheels real hard trying to find some traction. What, what do you say to recapture... Uh, and reorganize and, and talk to people in, in meaningful ways again. Well, I'm even worse. I'm a San Francisco Republican. Talk about an endangered species. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we're, make it even we're four worse. and a half to one here, if you can <laughs> beat that. I'm a San Francisco <laughs> Jewish Republican. We <laughs> 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 right, right now, the party's going through the same kind of turmoil that all losing parties go through when they get wiped out two, two elections in a row. Soul searching, which way do we go? I, I, was, I just moved to a new house and I'm cleaning out all my memorabilia. And I found a, an op-ed page from the Washington Post um, that was, was done in 1977. Actually, I'm not even sure they called them op-eds then, but, <coughs> but it was just after Carter was elected. And Carter had overwhelming majorities when he was when he was elected in, in 1976. And the, on the on the editorial page, the first half was now that the Democrats have responsibility for everything: the House, the Senate, the presidency. What are they going to do? The bottom article was about which way for the Republicans, left or right. Now things don't change very much. And when the Democrats get wiped out, they go through the same soul searching post McGovern. Uh, that led to the, ultimately to the Democrat Leadership Council, which was a group of centrist Democrats about bringing the party back to the center, and that's where Bill Clinton emerged and so on. So right now, we're, I would say we're leaderless. Uh, we're going through the, you know, which way do we go? Uh, conservatives, cer certainly talk radio, thinks that, that uh, you know, if McCain had only been more conservative, that he might have won, and we've got to stick to our principles. Uh, then there's the big tent school that says, you know, this is crazy, that's, you know, the moderates and the, the three that are left in the Senate, or two now, I guess. Uh, we took one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We well, took, he'll, we be, took he'll be back. Ten little <laughs> Indians. <laughs> <laughs> but, but um, you know, so do we, you know, we, we just got wiped out, and Frank can talk about this forever, but demographically in the last election, you know, young people, minorities, and so on. I mean, it, it, it doesn't look good for the future, but again, the biggest wipeout that, that I can remember, which was in uh, 1964 when Goldwater ran against uh, Lyndon Johnson, um, and that's when, you know, Republicans first stuck to their conservative principles and lost, I don't know, 47 states or something. Um, four years later, we had the White House. So I think the future is, it's a pendulum, and right now the Democrats have it, but you know, I'm not that worried about uh, what's going to happen in the next 20 years. Right? I, I don't know. I look at, the, I, and this is where I'm going to get into real trouble. I look at the Republicans who ran for president and those who are the leaders. Newt Gingrich became so unpopular, the Unabomber had a higher favorability <laughs> rating than him. <laughs> Mike Huckabee reminded people of Ned Flanders on The Simpsons. <laughs> Mitt Romney looked just like the guy in the Levitra ad. <laughs> <laughs> Are you on the beach road? <laughs> <laughs> You're touching him, is he on the beach <laughs> And Rudy Giuliani, who I worked for in New York in 93 and 97, ran the worst campaign ever for president. 
This guy ended the campaign with more wives than delegates. <laughs> the, the challenge for the Republican Party, and that, by the way, is the one that's going to cause me to have a dead horse in my bed someday. <laughs> the challenge for the Republican Party, you think I'm kidding. <laughs> The challenge for the Republican Party is to, number one, find people to reach out to 20-somethings because, my God, Obama, when he did, th when he did this thing, thank God I didn't miss. <laughs> 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 he did that with his wife, and from that, uh, uh, Obama did that with his wife, and they were coming up in Wisconsin when he was accepting, when he finally won, they did the fist pump. First off, Fox News, one of the Fox News commentators, which I work for and I'm very proud of, but one of them said it could have been a terrorist symbol. What are you, a moron? <laughs> <laughs> I, I do speeches for CEOs, and, and some 68-year-old guy who is the CEO of a major electronics company said Obama must have cancer because he can't shake hands. <laughs> so problem number one is they can't reach out to 20-somethings. Problem number two is the Latino community. They dropped from 37% down to 27%. This is Arizona. This is New Mexico, this is Texas, this is California. Problem number three is the African American community. Now there's nothing that the GOP can do as long as Obama's president because there is something special and something historic about his election. But even before that, Republicans could reach out to them. And it's not about selling out your principles. It's not about uh, moving to the left or to the right. It's opening yourself up so that people decide to join you rather than you trying to pull them in. You know, I, I look at the Republican Party and they're just so gosh darn old. <laughs> With all due respect to the old people in this room. I think, you know, I, I, I've, never, I've, I've never seen someone self destruct so quickly. Uh, I, mean, you, I, I think you've now insulted everyone in the room. And, and I've only been here 15 minutes. I mean, what were you doing before I got here? I was criticizing you for being late. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you will pay for that. Let me assure you. <laughs> now, I'm not a constituent. You will not pay for that. Oh. Well, let's see, guys. <laughs> Let me pick up on uh, Frank's. <laughs> trying, I'm trying. I'm trying. No, I'm trying my best here. <laughs> let, me, let me pick up on Frank's last comment. One of the several laugh lines. <laughs> no, this this question of uh, the let's call it the youth vote shorthand. Um, no news to anybody. No pun intended. That the so-called legacy media is virtually gone in that segment. Right, my kids don't listen, don't don't read the newspaper, don't listen to the radio. If you look at the the numbers, n no nobody in that demographic does. So, how's that how's that changing the job of uh, communicating to uh, for elected officials and and for you those of you that advise them? What what do you say? How do you make your choices? Where do you spend your money? I mean, there are pockets where, you know, probably Philadelphia being one of them, where still a lot of people watch network television and listen to the radio and so forth, but it's, uh, you know, the Inquirer filed for Chapter 11, and uh, that's more to come. So what, what, what do you say? How do you, how do you make sense of the tools at your disposal? Jump well, ball. I think you go, if you go back to television as the driver, which started in... Uh, actually in the Eisenhower-Stevenson election of 52, when television first became a factor. But it was always, it was always network television. Uh, I mean, if you didn't get on network television, the big three, you just, you just weren't on. And of course, the viewing habits of this country have changed so much. So it went from, from network to spot television, to, to cable, to, uh, you know, to alternative media, and, and yet, uh, you know, television certainly is not dead. St I mean, the Internet's extremely important. It's certainly a great fundraising tool. We'll see how Obama uses it to rally his base uh, on important issues because he's got just an enormous database there. Uh, but, you know, I, th I think every campaign advisor is still saying that, that uh, you know, if you can't raise the money to get on television, uh, don't bother to run. Frank? Mm -hmm. I want to own the web. 13 million email addresses Obama has and it's still growing. 
Republicans have 1.5 million. And it'll take them, based on how fast they're getting email addresses, they'll catch up with them in the year 2099. <laughs> <laughs> Most of you will be dead by then. <laughs> uh, and even if, but even if they had that, I'm just as interested in the tone as I am mm -hmm. in, in the medium, yeah. because you can reach them. You can reach them any. There's so many different ways to reach them. So many easy ways to target them. But if you've got no message, and you've got no rationale for them to connect to you, what good is it if you do connect to them? Yeah. Mayor Nutter, go back to the primary because let's just yeah. acknowledge your, uh, your general election is a bit of a cakewalk, 8317. Uh, but uh, how'd you make some of the critical choices? Because you were, uh, you were, let's acknowledge, uh, uh, behind in the pack. Uh, and behind. A late surge. Uh, uh, your daughter helped a lot. I was, I was at the end of the pack. <laughs> well, I was trying to be charitable. Yeah, that was nice. So how did you, how did you make your choices about uh, the, the medium? Um, I think much as uh, much as Bob said, and especially for a local election. And I mean, we were um, at least in the city. I mean, the, the whole internet uh, communication, the things that you could do, was still kind of evolving. I mean, I will admit uh, that uh, when I announced that I was running in the summer of 2006, I'm not sure at that moment that I actually knew what a blog was. I mean, I heard it didn't completely understand it, didn't you know, what, know what it was about. I mean, some younger people on the campaign finally explained it to me. Um, and uh, then we got into, you know, Facebook, and now, you know, there's, there's Twitter. I d don't exactly still understand what Twitter's about. I think I know what Facebook is about. People ask me, do I have a Facebook page? And by the look on my face, they usually know that. Um, <laughs> The technical answer is yes, um, <laughs> but um, I've never actually seen it. I don't know what it does, uh, but someone operates it. Uh, so for us locally, I mean, it is about television. Uh, and uh, the critical decision uh, was actually relatively simple. Um, in a mayor's race in Philadelphia, which is the biggest race uh, in the, in the four-year cycle, except sometimes president, but I mean, people take the mayor's race seriously here, um, it costs approximately $300,000 a week. Uh, to have any significant impact on television. Mayor's race is a TV race, and you're either on or you're not. You're either communicating or you're not. And then we did some other stuff as I got, uh, as, we, as we generated more money. Being on TV helped us raise more money, and you know, four hours a day, four to five hours a day, uh, calling up uh, people that I did not know and begging them for money, uh, that helped uh, as well. So the equation was pretty simple. Um, it's uh, $300,000 uh, uh, times, uh, or it's, the money you have divided by $300,000 says when you can go on TV. And we pretty much had a good sense of what we were going to have, and we ended up, I think we were on for about eight, uh, eight weeks or so, um, but that was, the, that was really the, uh, the, the, the calculus. Yeah. Um, and we made a second decision, or a simultaneous decision, that once we went on, we would never come down. So we had to know that when we went up, we were going to have enough money. Um, the one thing, uh, I guess I kind of instinctively knew this, but y you it really confronts you. Um, TV is not like um, buying some other good. Uh, you actually have to give them the money first uh, <laughs> before they will run your stuff. Uh, and you're and buying air, of course. You're too, you're right? You're you're right. You're buying air, and you have to give it to them before they run it, and there's a certain day that you have to give it to them by because there's a whole cycle. So I think it's like Tuesday. If you don't have the money in on Monday, your stuff is not running. You can be a nice guy, I, I have a lot of money, you know where I live, doesn't matter. <laughs> Wired in the account, we run. No money, no ads. So, you know, it's, uh, it's pretty straightforward. And at $300,000 a clip, it goes, uh, it goes pretty quickly. Uh, we had some great ads, uh, but I also worked uh, pretty hard, too. The networks yeah. are still trying to collect from Hubert Humphreys. <laughs> 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 is, that's is, why. is that that's why they're so why. stringent? Yeah. Okay, so it's, it's let's let's double fault. let's double back to the uh, kind of the uh, economic side of the equation for a second. Um, Mayor Nutter, you know that you've got some tough choices coming up just in the next couple of months: labor contracts, yeah. budget. Your constituents, you're going to ask to make tough choices. The American people have tough choices, uh, certainly relative to health care reform. Um, all of this talk about uh, the internet and communication and tone and so forth, 
Are people any better prepared to make tough choices today than, than at any point? Um, what I can tell you is that uh, when I announced, uh, I had the, um, it's really kind of crazy when I, when I think back on it. We were in the moment, so we didn't, uh, there was not much we could do about it. Um, I announced uh, back last September, w we didn't know how bad things were going to get. I mean, I think that the economic crisis absolutely, this is my opinion, these guys get paid for their opinion, uh, but as a more than casual observer, I mean, I think that when the economic crisis hit, about the third week or so uh, in September, uh, caused one candidate to suspend the campaign, the other, and uh, Senator Obama was, you know, kind of quiet and let me see what's really going on here. I mean, I think that that changed the course uh, of this, uh, of that uh, election, may have changed the course of, of history. Um, we were noticing uh, during the summer last year uh, that something was going on in the economy because our tax revenues uh, were continuing to decline uh, even as early as July. And then came August, and then I announced on September 11th last year, this just happened to be the date, that the city was facing a $450 million five-year deficit, and we knew it was growing. So we used language to be honest with people, and we said at least 450 in order to allow us to be honest and truthful because we knew it was <coughs> going to get worse. In October, I told the uh, Philadelphians that the number had grown uh, to between, uh, again, to, to give us some breathing room, between 650 and 850. At the same time, the Philadelphia Phillies were on their way uh, through the playoffs and potentially on to win the World <laughs> Series. Um, <laughs> take that. Um, <laughs> I, I told you it was. Not uh, anymore. Right. <laughs> I told you it was coming back at you. Um, and so that's going on. Then we have the most historic election in possibly any of our respective lifetimes. That's happening. And. Um, we had to push our announcements back because I now knew that we had a billion dollar deficit. And so the parade was on October 31st. Barack Obama gets elected November 4th. That's my recollection. And on November 6th, two days after the most historic election in the history of the United States of America, uh, I stood in front of a camera and told uh, Philadelphians that we had a $1 billion five-year plan deficit. You talk about being a life of the party. So. Um, <laughs> It, um, and people could not understand what was going on. We had a bunch of town hall meetings, uh, eight of them, just to show you how insane I am. Um, and I uh, let the public come out and holler and scream at me about some of the things that we were doing. And a lady stood up and said, uh, Mayor, who stole the money? <laughs> <laughs> she was serious as a heart attack. I burst out laughing. I mean, I just, you know, try to be serious at these things, but I mean, it's only so much you can take. <laughs> so, <laughs> at that time, people could not understand what in the world was going on, what had happened, why do we not have any money, why are we closing, you know, this center, that center, cutting services, laying people off, et cetera, et cetera. President Obama actually has helped me and helped us to communicate it because if the president says things are going to get worse before they get better, the Philadelphians here in the audience may have heard me say that a few times. Um, and so eight months later, I think people do have a much better sense of what's going on. They do know that they're going to have to make some sacrifices. They do know uh, that it's a national, international economic crisis, not created by any of us mere mortals uh, on the ground. And uh, that um, at this point, having a job is better than not having a job. And you hear very little talk, serious talk, about anybody uh, wanting uh, raises, and I want more of this, and I want more of that, and I want more of the other thing. Now, in a union contract negotiation, of course, you have to ask. Uh, but I think everyone knows that there is no money. Uh, and uh, the best way uh, for you to keep your job uh, is uh, to not ask uh, for any more, uh, unless we have to make more cuts. Frank, Bob, any comment on that question? On Christmas Day, we will hit 10% in unemployment if you don't hit it before then. We were doing work. Back in September, we were doing work back in September, uh, and we saw that this was going to be an awful Christmas. We put out the first poll that said that it was actually going to have a decrease in consumption, and we were criticized because even after 9/11, it actually still went up slightly. And I said, "No way!" And I'm going to tell you right now, 
this is going to be the worst Christmas in modern times because there is no extra money and still we are losing 500,000 jobs a month. At one time, it was as high as 17,000 jobs a day. And while the amount that we're losing is decreasing, that is the, it is not as dramatic as it was, it is still significant, and we're going up 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0.5% every month. And even though the public thinks that the economy is getting better, I will show you something. How many of you believe that you have a better quality of life than your parents when they were your age? If your quality of life is better than your parents, raise your hands. How many of you truly believe that your children will have a better quality of life than you when they get to be your age? Look at how few hands go up. That's the rub right now. That's what the mayor and the president and the elected officials have to address. For the first time in American history, the sense of intergenerational improvement has been broken. The promise that every generation would have it better than the previous generation. And the sacrifices that our parents did for us, that we are expected to do for our children, won't be enough. And that's the rub, that's the negativity, and that's where we are hoping that our political leaders, our corporate leaders, will be able to work together across partisan lines to find a solution so that our kids will have the same opportunities that we had when they get to be our age. Uh, I think leadership is about uh, or confidence, and I think the mayor exudes that, and I think the president now exudes that. But let me give you an example of somebody who had that but no longer has it, and that's my governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Now, he was won in a recall election, was overwhelmingly reelected um, two years ago. And next Tuesday on the, uh, in California, there's a special election. And it's about reforming the budget. I mean, California, they say, always leads the way. Well, we don't want to, you know, if you guys are from not, not from California, you don't want to lead the way we are leading because we are in a huge budget mess. We're in a legislative impasse uh, between the governor and the Democrats in the legislature. And despite Arnold's smoking tent, it's not helping very much. And so, it's gone on the ballot because that's what happens in California. When the legislature can't resolve anything, it goes on the ballot. So we often have, you know, 10, 20 propositions to vote on, both local and state. And we've got four or five to vote on next Tuesday. I don't know what the turnout's going to be, about 2%. But these are very important in terms of reform. They're all going to go down. And they're going to go down because I don't think people have any confidence anymore in the governor. And they certainly don't have it in the, in the legislature. And uh, I'm not sure what's going to happen as a result of that, except that there's going to be, you know, more cuts and more borrowing. I mean, we're supposed, to, like every other state, we're supposed to have a balanced budget. That's constant part of the, the charter. But, uh, you know, it's not going to happen. So here's somebody who was, that, I don't know, three, four years ago, people were talking about amending the Constitution. Yeah. So Arnold Schwarzenegger, who was obviously not uh, born here, uh, could run for the President of the United States. And today, uh, he's, you know, fighting off the, you know, the dogs nipping at his heels for that. So you can have confidence and you can say the right things, and he continues to say the right things, but if, you're in, if they're not believed by the public, uh, it doesn't matter what you're saying, I mean, uh, and how much conviction you have when you're saying them, because once you lose that, I don't think you get it back. <coughs> On that happy note, uh, <laughs> let's open this up to the audience and uh, take your questions for either individual panelists uh, or for the whole and see if we can generate a few more laugh lines. How about that? Yes, sir.
But I want to make sure that I'm always looking everyone in the eye, not reading something. Now, Obama reads a teleprompter really well. You feel like he's, huh. he means it. John McCain, Stevie Wonder reads a teleprompter better than John McCain. <laughs> Number one is you look people straight in the eye. Number two is that you engage in those town hall meetings that you did. You've got to give people a chance to vent. And here's the secret to this. You don't invite people to ask you questions. You ask them questions. If the mayor goes and asks half a dozen questions and starts pointing at people, what would you do in this situation? Everyone feels empowered. Everyone feels like they've had a chance to contribute. I always try to say this to politicians. They go into classrooms and they read to the little kids and they think they're doing great. Wrong. You have the kids. Kids read to you. And then parents are so proud of that. Number three is that you lower expectations. If you tell people things are going to be solved overnight, they won't believe you, they won't trust you, and so they won't follow you. Number four is you surround yourself with people who are smarter than you and you empower them to tell you when you're full of it. Because that's often what happens. That's what happened in the last administration. No one could tell Bush anything. And that was a huge mistake. And then the last thing is you give people measurable results again and again. Every month, if it's going up, if it's going down. Because then they'll feel a sense of accountability. They'll feel that, that you're able to see whether you're making progress. And I, I'll tell you, Obama's following most of that in how he's handling it so far. Any other takers on that question, Bob or? I, I think uh, great, great political leaders have a, an ability to, to frame and simplify the issues. And a lot of these are, are complex. I mean, the, the, the California issue that I referred to is a very complex issue. It's not, it's, it's not as simple as solving Social Security, which is either to, you know, to cut benefits or raise taxes. Those are really only the two answers. It's much more complicated than that. But the, the people that are really successful in the political business know how to do that whether it's instinctive or learned, but that's, that's what makes them uh, you know, stand out from the crowd. See, uh, yes sir, here. I mean, another, Frank's book talks a lot about the difference between words that are spoken and <coughs> words that are heard, mm -hmm. and the difference mm -hmm. there. Uh, you have a very interesting regional situation where you have a city, yeah. but you have the suburbs that you don't need them to vote for you, but you certainly need their support and their cooperation. When you're speaking, how conscious are you of the difference between the way city people hear what you say mm -hmm. and what suburban people hear what you say? Um, I'm, I'm very conscious. I, I assume anywhere, uh, I assume if I'm speaking any, first of all, anywhere I'm speaking in the tri-state area, I assume that uh, everyone in the tri-state area at some point in time, if they want to, or if they just happen to be walking past the TV uh, or see a newspaper laying out, I'm always speaking to the region whenever I'm talking. Um, and I spend a lot of time in the region. I was in Delaware County just the other day. I'm trying to form, uh, modeled on what uh, Mayor Daley did in Chicago uh, with the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus. I'm now trying to form a Metropolitan Caucus of uh, the leaders of Bucks, Chester, Delaware, Montgomery Counties, and Philly. Uh, so I always assume that I'm speaking to uh, the region uh, when I'm talking. Um, <coughs> and very, and more specifically, it was one of the reasons, although I thought it was a bad policy idea in the first <coughs> place, it was one of the reasons why I was so against uh, raising uh, the wage tax uh, to solve our problem here, uh, because not only was it a tax on Philadelphians who don't need uh, that uh, kind of circumstance, it was also a tax on all of our suburban uh, uh, residents who work uh, in the city. And so as I'm in the process of asking Harrisburg to give me relief, uh, with regard to raising the sales tax or pension fund relief, I'm also inadvertently taxing their constituents at the same time. Not a good political situation uh, for me or for us. So um, I'm always assuming that I'm talking to multiple audiences at the same time. By the way, it's not just words, it's also visuals. And one of the things we start to look at is the power of the visual. When Barack Obama did all of his primary night celebrations, even the ones where he lost, what we found is, because we studied what people looked at, we studied their eye patterns, that they would spend almost 80% of the time looking at the faces behind him, <laughs> and only 20% looking at him. And it really looked like America. It looked like a genuine <coughs> rainbow coalition. The most powerful visuals are either people or things that promote pride and patriotism. The number one in, in this country right now is the Statue of Liberty. When people see it, they think American pride and patriotism. 
Where is the Statue of Liberty made? And yet we think it is American. And she's, you know, got one arm up with the torch. When I think of the French, I kind of think. So <laughs> <laughs> I say yes, ma'am, on the wall there. Yes, ma'am. Hey, how are you, Lily? Um, it's like, yeah, it's uh, how do you how do you stay um, how do you stay focused on the priorities? Maybe you laid out uh, 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 the green economy was what Lolita, Lolita was talking about, and kind of gets sideswiped uh, by you're talking about the economic uh, crisis. How do you stay focused on the things that you're doing? Um, well, amazingly, uh, especially on green, uh, we've been able to uh, to maintain that focus. Uh, just announced our. Greenworks Philadelphia plan uh, uh, in the last uh, two weeks. Uh, we put uh, these uh, big belly trash compactors, solar powered, uh, made an announcement about that. I mean, some of these things were already in the works. Dollars had already been allocated, and we just made a decision that I wasn't cutting back on some of those priorities, and you know, we made cuts in other places. So um, there seems to be, a, uh, there's a little bit of thought uh, out there. I, I get commentators say to me, you know, oh, it's a shame what's happened, and you know, you've kind of gotten off stride with a lot of things that you wanted to do. And I said, well, you must have missed the press event about this, or uh, were you not paying attention? I mean, we're still doing what we had planned to do in many instances. Some we've had to slow down on a little bit. Maybe we're not as far along as we would have liked to have been. Um, but uh, y you just, you, you can't get, um, you just can't listen to all that chatter out there. I mean, I know where we're trying to go, uh, and if we manage our dollars right, keep communicating with the public and maintain our priorities, uh, we're, we're going to get there, um, but you know, maybe not as quickly as I'd like to. Let me tag on to that question for a second, particularly for, for Frank and, and for Bob. Go back to Obama and uh, a lot of reflection on the first 100 days and what I'll say is sort of the sheer audacity uh, of the agenda. Uh, not a day goes by where uh, seemingly, you know, all issues, all problems, all challenges, uh, there's, a, there's a new agenda item that's rolled out. A good move in that it creates a sense of energy and momentum or a bad move in that it communicates a diffuse message to the American people about what you really care about? I think it's the only move. Uh, if you don't get it done, get it going right away, it's never going to happen. So I think he's doing the right thing, and, and then there's the communication part of that, and I think he's doing as well as he can on that. But, but uh, administrations have to move really quickly while they have the, the goodwill to do it and the, the, the congressional support, and you can always see that beginning to erode both on the left and the right in some of the programs. No, I, I think it's exactly the right thing. Frank? And you've seen, and I've, I've taken a pretty pro-Obama approach here, and this is the one place where I've done it. There's only so much we can afford. There's only so much we can spend. There are a few kids here that may be coming to Penn next, uh, next semester, and you come with your parents here. I know how much this is going to cost. You know, part of my education was to study Medicare and Social Security and Medicaid and the programs, and the government says it only costs $10 billion, and it ends up within five years costing $100 billion. I know this is the government that should have helped people in Katrina, and it was absolutely pathetic that this is the government that said Freddie and Fannie could be bailed out with a few billion dollars if you read the Wall Street Journal today. Yeah. It's another, between them, it's another $22 billion, and there's no end in sight. Mm. At what point do you say we have to stop? We can't afford it anymore. Believe in the cause of health care. People need to be covered. Yeah. But at some point, Enough is enough. I was going to say, there goes that word enough again. Yeah. Uh, well, that is the difference between local government and federal government. It's called a balanced budget, right? Uh, in the back row, yes, ma'am. Yeah. 
<laughs> Unions. The end, it is very, if, you know, they say if you drive, if, you, if your politics are how you drive, and you, you politics in the middle of the road, and you drive in the middle of the road, you get run over on both sides. It is really hard. Republicans get jammed by Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity and Glenn Beck if they say something nice about Obama. If the Democrats say something nice about a Republican approach, they get jammed by MoveOn.org and other organizations like that. It is so hard. And sometimes mayors are freed from having to play that game. But there are so few people that have, and I'll give one example who I think is one of my favorite people in politics. I'm very fortunate to have known him, uh, and I'm proud of him, and that's Joe Lieberman, senator from Connecticut. He almost lost his career over it. And we'll see what happens in his reelection campaign. No, we talk bipartisanship, but that's not how it works in Washington. It's not how it works in any state. Ask Ed Rendell. There's no cooperation here in Pennsylvania. In the city government in New York, there's no cooperation. And it's sad, because in the end, we're more interested in scoring political points than we are in getting the job done. Oh, uh, let's see. Yes, ma'am, back here. willing to be lied to as long as their house value is going up and their retirement looks secure and they think that their kids are going to be upwardly mobile. And when the bottom falls out of that, that's when everything changes and that this is a, the time for honest leaders, not politicians so much as leaders who are willing to say this is the way it is. It's going to be hard, we're going to get through it together. And I think that, that there's a lot to be said for leaders who have come up through the meritocracy, who understand, um, like Mayor Nutter, like uh, President Obama, who understand the ramifications of their decisions on people's lives and yet are still willing to make those hard decisions and who are smart and well-educated and I, I just think that this is a very special, unique time for leaders that we are very lucky to have. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, um, I mean, I, I appreciate the compliment. And uh, the flip of that, and kind of a little bit of what uh, Frank said a second ago, um, kind of the different uh, kind of town hall meeting, I mean, what I've been confronted with is people have told me, I mean, this is a little bit of the, you know, Jack Nicholson, uh, um, I'm forgetting the name of the movie. No, Five Easy uh, Pieces? Uh, no, no, no. no. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> Tom Cruise and, and um, so a few good men, few good men uh, or, or women. Um, people said, you know, you know, I ran on reform. I ran on, you know, we're going to clean up the government. We're going to, you know, operate with integrity, transparency, and openness. Um, we did that uh, and almost got our heads taken off. Um, and so folks say they want us to tell the truth. Uh, and I'm going to tell the truth anyway. Uh, and then you end up suffering, uh, to some extent, the consequences, which is a reminder to all the other politicians or elected officials why maybe you don't tell the truth. Uh, and just try to kind of get by and then you know, deal with the truth later on when, when it's a little more comfortable or convenient. Um, so folks say they want to hear the truth. Uh, but when it really comes kind of raining down on them, uh, they go berserk. Sometimes, and so there's a there's a tension there, and you're always trying to figure out, you know, I want to lay out the situation, uh, but if you're really worried, uh, I mean, fortunately for me, I mean, I quit my job once uh, to run. I mean, I left city council, went out on this, you know, big limb, fifth place uh, for most of the campaign. I mean, if something were to happen, I mean, I think I have uh, some skills. I mean, I can find another job. Um, a lot of folks in public service. I mean, I'll just kind of say it here. I mean, it is absolutely the best job they're ever going to have in life. Mm -hmm. And so in this business, if you can just not do anything bad, not steal, don't get in trouble, you can hold these jobs for a long, long period of time versus taking s tough stands, taking tough votes, uh, telling the public the truth, and risk 
you know, what is now, you know, maybe you've got your kid at Penn, maybe you've got a big house, you've got this, you've got obligations, blah, blah, blah. And putting all that on the line for some folks uh, is a pretty scary proposition. And so the public says they want us to tell them the truth. Uh, but when we do, uh, it is often a different story, uh, you know, at the polling place. It's, it's very interesting watching that dynamic. Do you find that to be true, uh, Frank? Is there a, you know, say one thing and uh, yeah, the man? I was asked because I become very cynical in the process. I, moved, I lived in Washington, D.C., and I moved to L.A. or moving to L.A. right now because I've had enough. And I just, I probably gave up. Uh, I wanted to have these conversations and discussions. I don't know if there's a reporter in this room because if there is, I know that by Monday, comments I made will be on the blogs. By Tuesday, Rush Limbaugh will do a five-minute rip on me. But I don't look at the politicians, I look at the people. And I want one segment of the population that gets so forgotten, the American dream, which to me is the most important concept. The definition for Americans now is financial success. Freedom is now fourth. There's one group that picks home ownership as number one, bless you, the Latino community, the Hispanic community. To them, that's the definition. You may, uh, Anheuser-Busch, I don't know how many of you speak Spanish. But Anheuser-Busch, to relate to this, did the most wonderful ad about this young Latino girl. She's leaving home for the last time. She's got a suitcase under one arm. She's got a plant under another. And she's in tears because she's leaving home and her parents are crying, her husband's crying. So she goes out the door, shuts it behind her, goes down the stairs into the street, across the street, up the stairs to the house right across the street from hers, <laughs> goes to the refrigerator, grabs a Budweiser and says, Mikasa. <laughs> For the Latino household, that is the definition of the American dream. I'm Jewish. Living across the street from my mother would be the American nightmare. <laughs> Too much. Okay, I'm watching the clock. I know you all have lots of... Uh, Folks to catch up with, uh, coming up to cocktail time. I'm going to take one question. I know you've been yeah. wanting to ask one. Uh, Mr. Mayor, you've never been a member at any time of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, correct? Correct. Right. Are you now or have you ever? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I, was trying to figure out which, I was trying to figure out which group I was in. <laughs> 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 okay, so you're not responsible for setting the current crisis. No. With a panel of comments on loose Fed policy in 2001, after 9-11, and, and, and how it drove the housing bubble with the allowing interest on the loan, and then Fed tightening, can what, can, can what politician other than picking the federal government <coughs> ever exerts any influence over Fed policy? Thank you all very much. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, as Barack Obama once said, that's above my pay grade. <laughs> 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 I'd rather not to, could you not, try not to dodge this question? This is a good one. How, can, we, can, we, can we talk about Fed policy and how it affected the economy? Maybe that's can wait for cocktail pay. hour. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, I, well, listen. I feel potholes. <laughs> well, so we'll get a, a special exception rule on that. Get one more question okay, from the crowd. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> is this a joint question or a... Oh, okay. It's Levitra. <laughs> she just said to me, he's not on Levitra. <laughs> <laughs> Ma'am, you protest too much. <laughs> I have to tell you that we heard you five years ago. I think it was when, uh, when Harry was running and you were much funnier than Scott. And you were much funnier It's easier when you lose. Is it, is it my shirt or my hair? <laughs> teams and the end um, goal is to win. And I think considering the change in the configuration of this country in the next 50 years, I will not be here, and even Levitra won't change that, <laughs> but in 50 years, especially because of the emergence of China and India, this country is going to have, a, have to have a different face. And I think it's a shame we don't have politicians who can get together and long-term plan this, especially for the people. But, uh, thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Um, but my question is, I hope you don't mind this question, but when I heard that Sarah Palin was uh, the, going to be the vice presidential nominee, and especially after I read more about her, I thought, somebody is trying to throw the election. And I really want to know who, I mean that, I really know in my mind what, what their goal was. Who chose Sarah Palin? <laughs> 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 well, that's a serious question because I don't believe it was John Kay. The Federal Reserve. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say David say Letterman. I'm going to save that for a cocktail hour or two. <laughs> listen, oh listen, folks, please join me in thanking these terrific Penn alumni. <laughs>